Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's discussion. Uh, it's a panel discussion, as you know, among participants, four participants uh, from um, three different uh, Visegrad, uh, four different Visegrad countries. Um, no, actually, I counted wrong. Four part three participants in three different countries, um, moderated by my colleague, uh, Pavel Marczewski. Um, the topic is new European Orientalism, and with that, we really want to address a question which has been troubling many of us of late, as you can imagine, the question of the resurgence of old stereotypes. And of course, you can imagine I have a particular affinity to the question of Orientalism because of where I come from. And uh, it is a recurring theme in what we as anthropologists, and I say we because I have an anthropological colleague here, Michel Bukhovsky, who is an old friend and an old colleague. We are both fellow anthropologists. He was my successor as president of the European Association of Social Anthropology. So I'm very happy to welcome him to the IWM. Um, and then I have uh, Anna uh, Durnova, who is senior researcher at the Institute of Advanced Studies here with us at the moment, and Anna uh, uh, Vishvitsky, who is the uh, head of research at the Institute of Eastern uh, Central Europe in Lublin. Uh, so with our participants, the question we would like to look at is, are we back in the area, age and era of old stereotypes, stereotypes about what we as anthropologists call othering, stereotypes which are negative in the way in which the other is defined in relation to oneself. And as you know, one of the divisive questions has been the question of migration. And that has led to a serious divide. But with that political divide has come a whole baggage of perceptions and misperceptions of the others. And the puzzle for many in Western Europe has been why are Eastern European democracies, uh, new democracies which themselves had this experience of open borders and constituting themselves new with these open borders being exactly the ones which are so proving so inhospitable to those who are in need of those open borders today. And I think we can debate the political question, but what is really striking is the stereotypes which have come back to hit us with all the misperceptions carrying a long historical baggage of characterizing the other as irrational, as backward, as not really belonging to enlightened Western Europe. And I think that's going to be the dual theme of tonight's discussion. And with that, I would like to welcome all our uh, three uh, participants. I would like to especially, however, thank first Ambassador Lorkowski, the ambassador of Poland here to Austria, who's uh, not only present tonight, but we, and I personally, but the IWM as an institution owes him a deep debt of gratitude for all the support we've received from him over the years. And so I'm very pleased that you gave us the idea for the discussion and have made it possible to be present. Thank you very much. And I look forward to a wonderful discussion. Let me welcome all of you to tonight's discussion. Let me welcome my guests. Uh, let me just uh, introduce them briefly, even though Shalini already mentioned a few important details regarding their scientific credentials and so let me let me mention them in order of seating. Anna Visvizi, who is uh, the first person sitting on my right, is head of research at the Institute of East Central Europe in Lublin, but she's been conducting research um, both in the States and in different countries of uh, of Europe. Uh, um, uh, main topics are political economy of European integration. She's been uh, especially prolific uh, when it comes to discussing political economy of the Greek crisis in a broader European context. But she's also preoccupied with politics, economy, and security politics uh, policies in Central Europe with a special focus on, on Visegrad countries. Uh, and also um, global safety and security, including 
transatlantic relations uh, um, in the middle is Professor Michał Buchowski, uh, who is Professor of Anthropology uh, in, at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. He's uh, particularly interested in social and economic transformations of post-communist Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and he's published extensively on the topic. His publications um, include uh, books like Reluctant Capitalists from 1997, The Rational Other, uh, also from 1997, Rethinking Transformation from 2001, and uh, also edited volumes, for example, Poland Beyond Communism from 2001, or The Making of the Other in Central Europe. Uh, he's also a professor of Comparative Central European Studies at the European University in Viadrina in Frankfurt, Oda. Uh, and he also served as uh, uh, head of uh, European <coughs> Association for Social Anthropologists uh, a few years back. Um, and uh, my third guest is uh, Dr. Anna Durnova, who is currently uh, a researcher senior researcher at the Institute of Advanced Studies here in Vienna, where she's coordinating a project entitled Negotiating Truth, Semmelweis, Discourse on Hand Hygiene and the Politics of Emotions. And already this topic um, indicates uh, the main field of uh, interest of Dr. Turnova, a rather interdisciplinary field, some in the crossroads of uh, uh, policy studies, uh, emotions, uh, and public policy. Um, she was visiting professor at the Masaryk University in Brno, but she was also a lecturer and researcher at diff and visiting fellow at different universities all across Europe, including University of Lyon, universities of Essex and, uh, and Prague. So uh, let me welcome my guests and welcome all of you. I'm glad that, uh, that uh, you weren't discouraged by the awful weather outside, and you came to join us to discuss, uh, well, we'll see whether these are recurrent divisions between East and West, uh, or um, rather symptoms of, uh, of a new political constellation that is re-emerging, uh, not only in, uh, in Europe, not only in Eastern Europe, but all across the globe. Uh, I have to confess that when we were discussing the topic of today's discussion, uh, it was long before Brexit, it was long <laughs> before Trump. So we were preoccupied particularly with, uh, with, uh, with a situation in Europe after the so-called refugee crisis. Uh, we were preoccupied with, uh, um, well, lack of understanding, uh, lack of compassion, and what some also call lack of solidarity between Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, where these two parts of the continent seem to be totally unable to co to communicate with each other, to to, um, to basically convey their interests and their and their perspectives to each other. So let me start uh, this discussion by uh, with a short quote. Uh, this is New York Times from uh, mm, 12 September 2015. Rick Lyman renowned foreign correspondent who is very interested in, in Eastern Europe, uh, wrote, um, the stance of Central European countries reflects a mix, uh, reflecting a mix of powerful far-right movements, nationalism, racial and religious prejudices, as well as economic arguments that they are less able to afford to take in outsiders than their wealthier neighbors, is the latest evidence of the stubborn culture the cultural and political divides that persist between East and West. So let me start by asking how accurate is this rather strong quote from New York Times? Uh, can we find similar elements uh, or, or elements of a similar stance also in Western Europe? And to what extent does this diagnosis hold today? The format is following. Anyone from uh, on the podium can pick up the question. Uh, we will do a, a round of questions and then we will open uh, mm, the discussion also to your comments and questions. 
Should I say ladies first? <laughs> Should I start? Shall I start? If you want to. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. And I can only join uh, Pavel for thanking you to come, uh, even if the weather is not so comfortable, for doing that. And I'm going to start with, um, um, with the first reflections I had when we agreed on the topic and when uh, I was thinking about um, the events of last year and especially about how the media coverage was stating on both sides that this is a sudden change and sudden event, that actually we didn't know so far that there were such a different views on migration, that there were such a different views on multiculturalism. And for the moment, I'm not going to argue whether this is only a discourse powerful in the region where I come from, or whether this is also in the Western Europe. I leave, it, I leave that for a later moment. But I'm going to start with the suddenness, because I don't think, and this is what I would like to argue this evening, tonight, um, that this is, not, this is not a sudden change. It's a rather an outcome of a process that we are actually facing since 1989. When, in 1989, to cut the long story short, um, the Czech Republic was, at that time Czechoslovakia, was seen uh, at the beginning of a new era, becoming a member of what was very often in the public language called as the Golden West, or the West where we wanted to go. It was actually, firstly, doing so in a very strongly economic language. So what was at stake? was a transformation, was an institutional and post-communist transformation, but primarily in economic terms. And within these, there were discourses that came afterwards, but they were all coupled with this powerful economic discourse. So you could argue that actually the, the region was told that it should first have the powerful economy, and then the culture and civil society will just come along. It was also quoted as such by many scholars from political science, the discipline I come from, where it was for a long time argued that democracy and economy are interrelated, and when you have a powerful economy, you would have a rise of democracy. However, I would argue that what we can see right now in the Czech Republic, and I can speak, mo speak mostly for that country, is a certain lack of civil societal organization. It's not that there wouldn't be people that would organize themselves in demonstrations, public events, or petitions. But the, the level of the civil society is a different one. And I think that it's actually the heritage of this very powerful economic discourse that was not driven only by the region, but also by the Western countries. So first of all, I would say it's not a sudden change. It's an outcome of a process. And it's a process that hasn't been launched only by the region, but it has been launched by both of them. Actually, Western European countries were inviting the new members to accept this powerful economic language. So, in an ironic note, and I'm going to leave it there for a moment, in an ironic tone, one could argue that Western European countries should not be stunned by this lack of civil society, because they haven't been really doing anything for it in the last 25 years. What they have been looking at in the region was if these people are doing well on economic terms, if they are having a good economic figures, if they can accept euro. They were not looking at how the civil society is organized. So maybe it's about time to look at that and see whether we can find a dialogue for that kind of transformation. Should I? Yes, sure. All right. Um, thank you very much for, for having me here tonight. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. It's the first time I'm in Vienna and I already had the opportunity to see Schönbrunn and I'm really impressed. So um, I got back to the original question and the issue of stereotypes. Um, I'm an economist but also a political scientist and very much inclined into theories of international relations and sociology. Uh, the more interested I was in this specific topic of today's discussion. Um, so the question of stereotypes rings a very specific bell 
constructivists emphasize that social reality is constructed and things acquire meaning by means of our agreement that things serve certain purpose. So um, the issue with stereotypes, to cut the story short, has the following role in any societies. People use stereotypes whenever they want to define issues that they do not necessarily understand. So constructivists would refer to this as intersubjectively shared meanings. So we recall those intersubjectively, intersubjectively shared meanings in order to describe the reality in which we operate. Now the thing is, the more complex and the less understandable this, this uh, environment in which we operate is, the more frequent our referrals to uh, stereotypes will be. So the fact that in times of crisis, be it an economic crisis, be it a social crisis, be it a political crisis, being a, be it a refugee crisis, it's just as natural as people were recall and will refer to stereotypes because in this way it's much easier for them to define and to organize the reality that they have to cope with on a daily basis. So this is um, one of the issues that I would like to uh, argue along in this discussion. And when it comes to civil society, I would pose this question or this issue differently. I do not think that this is a problem that has emerged post 89. Quite the contrary, many external commentators highlight that especially Poland is not proud enough of the fact that Poland has developed civil society and if it was not for that civil society, Poland wouldn't have had the round table in June 1989. We wouldn't have the elections. So um, in a way, which is what several external foreign commentators that view Poland and love Poland, what they say is that well, several countries that seek to democratize, they should take greater um, advantage from the lessons that could be drawn from the Polish case. Now I'll leave it here, um, giving, it, giving voice to you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me voice. And uh, also I thank you for inviting me, etc., etc. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am neither an economist nor political scientist. As Shalini said, I am a social anthropologist. And anthropology is the study of the other and the way the other is created. So, yes, this is constructivism that uh, you know. Did, uh, so also, I would like to cut the long story short that this was a kind in the, in the past, the, several points. The, in, in the recent past, let's say be, before 1989, uh, it was easy to divide people into those Easterners and Westerners, and the political system somehow strengthened this actually 19, 18th, 19th century division, uh, which made, for instance, I don't know, Western Poland, Eastern Europe, and uh, Eastern Germany, Eastern Europe, why Vienna, which is much more eastward, was, was Western Europe. Yes, uh, but this is uh, a, a logic of uh, binary logic that people are ready to apply in any context, in any situation, and this is a logic or, or, or which refers to some ingrained or inherited from the, uh, from, from from the intellectual history from from the past categories. Whenever it is possible and whenever it is applicable, or they think it is the world can be divided in, in this dichotomous way. So the first point, because this was just raised by my two my predecessors uh, here, uh, speakers, uh, uh, mm, uh, civil society. I mean, this was also the picture of Eastern Europe, of the, the so-called Eastern Europe, that civil society was non-existent there, that there was uh, social anomie, anomie and so on. Yeah, the notion of civil society as it was used by the West was not applicable to the uh, Central and Eastern European societies because, well, I, it's, it's not, I am not advertising this because it was many years ago I even wrote an article that in a, which was published in 1996 that, well, actually, if you look at the form of the self-organization of the people and their membership in, in, in local, uh, local uh, organization of the uh, countryside uh, 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 fire brigades or uh, in or, or all other this type of organizations and solidarity itself. This was a self-organized actually civil society which didn't simply fit the definition that civil society are NGOs and that's 
uh, and that's it. So this, uh, this dichotomy doesn't pay in, in this respect or didn't pay in this respect in the past. Either I'm not sure also when the, civil, the notion of civil society uh, was uh, coined here, uh, whether now civil society doesn't exist. I know that many people complain about it, but you look, if you look at the number of NGOs that do this and that, and actually as in other, as in Denmark or in, in, in Scandinavia, they actually do the job which was, uh, or in some situations perhaps should, uh, context should be assigned to, 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 to authorities, to, to, to government or to local governments. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it, it, it can be counted in tens of, uh, tens of thousands of such organizations. Uh, now, the question of, of the, the, the which I mentioned at the very beginning, of division into East and West, which resurfaced again in the context of this, uh, this so-called uh, refugee crisis, I, I say. Uh, refugee crisis, I rather use the term the crisis of, the, of Europe or crisis of uh, European values. By the way, everything is now in crisis. Yes, we, we have a crisis of authority, so we have a crisis of religion, crisis, refugee crisis, political crisis, democracy crisis. Well, it's difficult to live in this world. We are all in crisis and there is no uh, optimism in it. Well, okay, anyhow, uh, I think that this is a simplification referring to, to the citation that, with which you have started, it's a, it's a kind of a, a intellectual laziness because whenever you don't know how to name the things, you, you reach out to these old categories and they say, you see, they are Easterners because they behave di differently than we expect. And why they do behave I differently than we do? Well, because they are Easterners. So, and, and you always can say, well, they, or that it's a, it is a, a post-communist legacy. It is communist and now they are still show, show this. Well, of course, this is a picture that, uh, again, as, uh, on the political map, this is red, this is uh, yellow, this is, uh, this is uh, blue, and, and, and so on. The other point that I can make uh, to this kind of statement as this New York Times it was, uh, uh, is that, well, it's not only intellectual laziness, but, well, they identify, uh, in many cases, I am not saying that the, the phenomena which, are, which we don't like, like the attitude towards refugees, for instance, which I am very strongly critical myself, and, and uh, well, this is the discipline uh, tradition, uh, but not only, of course, it's a humanistic tradition, is that this, uh, is that the attitudes of the people in the region are identified with the attitudes of top politicians, who also play political games at the same time. And uh, if they say, let's say, I don't know, Orban or, or or, or Kaczynski says that we don't want them, and, and, and that it doesn't mean that millions of other people do think differently. And there is resistance to mm -hmm. such attitude. Yes, there is a, there is a lot of xenophobia which, which uh, I will always condemn, and I, I believe not only uh, me, of course. And, and, and there is a lot of uh, you know, fears, cultural fears against imagined refugees, because especially in the case of Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Poland, there are no refugees. They, they be, can be counted on, at the moment when, when, uh, when uh, Beata Szydło, Polish Prime Minister, by the way, she's uh, trained ethnologist, which is a surprise that, uh, she, uh, she was talking about millions of refugees in Poland. They were from Syria. This was not true. I mean, uh, there were maybe, when you count it, very, very, uh, well, in a, in a in a Boyan way, then maybe there were one million people, immigrant people on contemporary contracts and illegal, partly illegal migrants, immigrants from, from, from Ukraine especially, but not only, of course. Uh, but at this moment, there were two, two refugees from Syria in, in, the, in the Polish, uh, Polish uh, centers for, 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 for asylum seekers. So, uh, well, the point which I want to make is that this was a cultural fear that was somehow created and I, uh, I can also try to interpret it in, in uh, somehow why it, it, uh, it appeared there. But the point is that this is again a binary logic which is applied that, uh, that this is in the East and then you assign it to 
because of the ages of them being Easterners, and they were under communism, and, 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 and nationalism is, is uh, somehow inscribed in these people or in their bloods, and so on. So, and there is a resistance to it. So this is what I am uh, trying to say. And last uh, point to this point. I mean, there are millions, if not tens of hundreds of millions of people who, in that sense, even if you try to make these big categories and assign this, because different people have different you know, meanings and they, the, the same, they use the same words and, and use them differently and so on. Well, look at the elections in, in, in the States yeah? or Brexit. This is all based on these assumed Eastern characteristics that we are Orientals from Eastern Europe and so on. Then I would say those who voted for Brexit, they are Orientals in Great Britain, and those who voted for, uh, for Trump, they mm -hmm. are Orientals in, in the United States. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> um, to start a new round of controversies... Or in... in sorry, or in no. Austria. <laughs> We are about to see <laughs> to what extent are there, uh, uh, on, on, which, on which side of the divide are they really. But um, mm, you mentioned uh, two important things. Uh, the first is the role of uh, civil society. Um, it's very much true that after 1989 it was assumed that uh, mm, economic affluence will pro bring with itself uh, a certain deal of democratization, uh, but I'm not entirely sure if uh, civil society was entirely off the table. People were concerned about civil society, people were concerned about building civil society, uh, about networks of, uh, um, about building networks of um, uh, civil engagement and, and, co uh, and cooperation. But my question is, is really civil society um, as sufficient um, a, a sufficient institution when it comes to countering xenophobia, racism, or lack of solidarity. If you look at Pegida, for example, uh, a lot of German researchers are writing about the black side or dark side of, uh, of the civil society, where people organize themselves uh, to an entirely different effect, with an entirely different intention. Uh, and there were acts of spontaneous act of the spontaneous acts of, of, of civil self-organization also in Poland but I, uh, I experienced this also in, in Bulgaria for example where people were um, trying to emulate uh, in a way uh, American vigilantes that are patrolling um, the American Mexican border uh, and uh, there were cases where people for example there was a famous case of a security guard who stopped a uh, uh, a Syrian uh, asylum seeker on the street uh, demanded documents, demanded uh, a proof that he actually has a right to live in Poland. So you also have this dark side of civil society. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if we are, uh, when we are actually discussing civil society as a necessary prerequisite for, for countering these problems like xenophobia and nationalism, are we not sticking paradoxically to this old uh, orientalist cliches from before 1989 and shortly after. That what la actually lacks in Eastern Europe is strong civil society. You are an expert on civil society. Well, if you say so. <laughs> well, I'll try to um, summarize the thoughts that your question just provoked. And I would suggest to Forget for a moment about the values we stand for and forget about the xenophobia and look at the civil society as a vehicle that I need in any society as a vehicle that is a constant moment of critique, which is to say that civil society is the challenging moment to any governing elite, regardless of which values this governing elite is having, and that civil society is a vehicle that actually tries to balance the power in a sense that um, you, can go, you cannot go towards authoritative ways of power, that you stay democratic. And democratic in this sense doesn't mean necessarily forget about the values, it just means that you, are, you keep negotiating, that you're there, you're at the table. 
and you explain. You don't order, you explain. You try to explain yourself, you try uh, to do in the media coverage so that you win the elections, you try actually to bring people in so that they consent, you don't order. And in that sense, I think that civil society is a crucial vehicle. And yet you're right. We have experienced last year that the notion of civil society, as we knew that, and it's true that it has been the strong liberal democratic tradition of civil society based on autonomy of the individual and dignity of the individual and solidarity and compassion that goes along with that. It was the civil society, notion of the civil society we've been used to, and yet in 2015 we discovered an, a, a same vehicle, the same momentum with completely different values where people, and specifically in the Czech Republic, it was stunning in which way people are using the same techniques, the same arguments, but the other way around. In saying we are not going to be oppressed by this democratic fascism. We are not going to be oppressed by these people that are actually multicultural faces. That was one of the, one of the hit points of the discussion in, in the Czech um, discourse and basically social media discourse. Um, so then the question is how do we cope with that? My answer would be maybe a radical one. Yeah, we, we keep negotiating. We try, that's, that's what's problematic about democracy, but that's the only way we have. We just try to persuade them, we just try to negotiate, and we, we take that as, uh, as a part of, our, of what is at stake. So labeling these people as irrational activists doesn't help. It didn't help in 1970s when these people were, for instance, uh, pioneering for uh, an abortion law. It didn't help. It didn't help when ecological activists in 1970s in the US were starting with the first campaigns. It, didn't, it doesn't help. We need to take these people on board in, in a sense, I'm not saying taking them on board in terms of elections, but taking them on board and try to see what's behind that. And I think that Anna says nicely that we constantly think about these stereotypes and these stereotypes are very often on both sides. That's, that's basically the, the notion of the stereotype. And they come forward, especially when things happen in a very fast way, which was actually the case in 2015. And when this happens, these stereotypes are actually, when we can imagine them as a sort of uh, critical policy scholars, as myself, tend to speak about, not only about discourses, but about embedding knowledge, which is to say that once an event happens, you embed this event in what you know. You could imagine a child that actually knows an event and when a new comes, it tries to, he or she tries to embed it in what, what is known. And that's what we do. That's what we do on, on our daily basis. So when, this, when something comes, there are related embedded discourses, maybe negative experiences. And I think that one of the important negative experiences with this uh, 2015 was that all these states, what they were actually fighting against in their post-communist era was that someone is ordering them something, that someone is saying, you ought to do that. So what happened then, that this quota system that was rejected was also re rejected because it was embedded in this logic that they tell us what we ought to do, yet we are not there anymore and we are not going to do that because we are grown up and we, are, we can say no. And I think this was maybe even more important, I would argue, that the question about xenophobia, about the lack of multiculturalism. I think it was a very, very powerful discursive argument that has been used by all these representatives because it was to say, now we can say no and we do it because we are not going to do as you tell us. And I wouldn't forget that before 2004, it was actually the discourse that they have, that all the countries have apprehended, because in order to become the member of the European Union, it, has, it had to apply a certain list of criteria. So I think that was, again, another embedness that came, came forward. So I think that when we, when, we, when we speak about these events, we need to keep in mind what other knowledges and experiences that are not necessarily related to xenophobia were supporting one or the other argument because then maybe we can come more forward or more toward the, the dialogue that I think personally should be pursued, whatever the values are. Um, let me just pick on one of the points that you made. I, I very much agree on this, that uh, there's certain truth in what you said, that um, 
there was a certain resistance in the societies vis-à-vis uh, -vis the question how the system of um, refugee reallocation was proposed, possibly negotiated at the EU level. There was a feeling across the societies in the European Union that the societies or the national governments were somehow not involved or involved not enough. And uh, to a certain extent, it resonated in Hungary, then it was used instrumentally by, by Orban. Um, but it was used instrumentally by Orban because he's also involved in this uh, um, competition with Jobbik, so he would have done it anyway. Um, it, was instrumentally, it was used instrumentally in other countries as well. Now, um, this is representative of, an, of another problem that we are experiencing in, in the European Union, and Brexit is also a manifestation of it, that to a certain extent this um, deliberative intergovernmentalism that has emerged in the years of the euro area crisis has basically pushed some countries out of the core of the European uh, integration process in the sense that several countries, and this was, this was one of the points that uh, the United Kingdom made and it was also negotiated in the uh, UK-EU settlement from February last, um, this year, uh, was that the countries are not discriminated against if they are not members of the Eurogroup whereby several important decisions were taken only within that group. So um, we can think of other examples where decisions were not necessarily taken on the basis of open um, negotiation process involving everyone in the same extent. So um, I think this is part of the process. And I think this created a ground very ripe for um, repro reproduction of stereotypes and new divides in the EU. And what I'm heading at is that uh, the divides that we observe in the EU today do not concern only this divide um, east and west, because this is what we see in Poland. But if we ventured uh, an adventure of going to Greece or Italy, you would realize that there's a very strong uh, uh, discourse on the north-south division. And the same way as in Poland or in the Czech Republic, uh, there is this feeling that maybe now they are treating us as us being the Easterners. In the same way, there is the discourse, a very similar one, whereas now they see us as the Southerners and we are the ones that are losing because this is how they treat us. So I think there is also another problem or another phenomenon that emerges is that in our understanding that we are being othered, um, we are too defensive in how we approach those that other us in this process because it might be an automatic uh, mechanism. I don't know, I'm not a... So, uh, psychologist, but uh, what I would think is that there is not enough of effort to engage in, a, in an open discussion. And this is something that you mentioned in your first point. What about communication? Do we actually communicate effectively? Everyone mentions media. What role have the media played in the process of reproducing, consolidating all stereotypes on the occasion of the refugee and migration crisis and on any other crisis that we are experiencing today. There are so many crises, but why are they there? Well, because the media reproduce them. And why, they do, why are they doing them? Well, because this probably sells well. I don't know, I'll leave it here. So. I agree. That, uh, that part of the story, you know, is in a sense, is in the hands of media, but on the other hand, media somehow represent what uh, or what people do expect and and and, and this is kind of a circular you mm -hmm. know, also explanation of uh, of this uh, phenomenon but i wonder because i didn't quite get it you said that we who we and who, that we that we we see that we are perceived as the other i mean all right so let me say it in an academic language. Yeah. But observing the, um, or by looking at the discursive interventions of politicians um, taking their positions in discourses at the EU level, you can understand that rather than engaging in dialogue, they basically take any, um, any stereotype, any, any stereotypical description of countries um, in the East as a personal offense. So I'm not hinting to anyone in particular, but 
if you read through the media, if you really try to dig into the discourse as it unfolds, you do not see enough of an effort to bridge the divide. Rather, uh, you see a degree of uh, assertiveness at the political level. So rather than um, responding to any claim of you are not, uh, you are not expressing solidarity, you don't, really see, you don't really hear a counter argument. And I think this is worrying. Because in the same way as Eastern country, or countries of the Visegrad group have received considerable criticism, particularly with regard to how we have reacted to uh, refugees and migrants, so have other countries received considerable criticism uh, with regard to other issues. So I think what we ought to do, and particularly in this kind of discussions, we ought to have a comprehensive view to see what others are experiencing at the same time as we have our own problems, and possibly in this way, much more balanced way, approach these criticisms. And then we would realize that, in essence, all those stereotypical depictions that we receive or read about in the press are nothing more than you know, one journalist's description because he had a better day or a worse day, and this is what the editor decided to publish. And someone else reproduced on social media. And the problem is that today everyone is an editor. So this basically takes us to a quite different discussion again, to education and freedom of speech and how we <coughs> ensure that and how we make sure that people are not bullied and so on. So in this context, what Twitter did uh, today, basically, a few days ago, is it's wonderful that finally they took a position on what to do with cyberbullying and harassment and, and whatever else online. So there are some barriers, right, and, and borders. So let, let me just pick on this. On this. this uh, uh, they and we and they the distinction. Yeah, I mm. I reviewed a PhD at Humboldt University uh, about the European Commission, and uh, this uh, student uh, he he spent several months, uh, you know, interviewing these people and so on. And he his finding was but actually, yeah. This kind of us and them, old Europe and new Europe uh, distinction, it operates in everyday discourses uh, among these uh, politically correct, it is noticeable, notice noticeable, even among these politically correct, you know, uh, uh, quite high functionaries at the EU level. And it, that it, it, it's, a, a, in a sense, an everyday phenomenon. But then, what, what is interesting in, in what you both said is, and I think there is a kind of a mechanism involved in it, that, well, these stereotypes or this, this uh, othering, it has a power of creating this, uh, I mean, you have to be in power to create a category, like Eastern Europe and uh, we, the Westerners, and they, the Easterners. But then, usually people who are, in that sense, somehow uh, oppressed, or put in the lower position, they tend to resist it somehow. I mean, and it takes a, a place on, uh, on, on several levels of, of social reality. Let me give an example from, from the past, let's say. When Polish farmers, for instance, were uh, resisting neoliberal reforms, they were immediately contained by the intellectuals, some intellectuals, especially political scientists and, and, and uh, sociologists, but in public discourses, in media and so on, that why do they resist this wonderful neoliberal reform? Well, because they don't understand the system. Why do they don't understand the system? Because they are not educated. And, if they are, and they are uh, homo sovieticus. So by resisting the system, you somehow reinforce the image of you as somebody who doesn't fit this picture of, the, of this you know, upper class, let's say, or, or, or elites, or uh, Western Europe. And at the moment, in this, in this context, at the moment when uh, in this kind of, you know, uh, kind, uh, I, I don't want to use resistance again, but uh, this kind of a reaction to the kind of a perceived as a dictatorship of the EU, of the Brussels, or the Western countries that, uh, yeah, they, they, they used this, they, they resisted it, and in that way, I mean, leaders 
like Orban and others, and, and Kaczynski and others, they actually confirmed, in a sense, something they were assigned at the very moment, you know, they were described as Easterners. Oh, you see, they behave like this because they are Easterners. And they, conf by not accepting this quota and uh, not accepting the EU policy towards immigrants and multiculturalism, and they simply confirm that they are Easterners. Mm, because they are. <laughs> well, it's not a question of, of this. I mean, people live on this territory and so on, but this is a conceptual category which has some, which is burdened with so many meanings. Yeah? It's not neutral description that in Czech Republic, Poland, and then Slovakia, and then in Hungary, there are people that uh, people live that have different attitudes toward life, lifestyles, and so on, uh, hipsters and, and, and nationalists, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, you just use this label in order to classify these people as better or worse. And this is the problem. I mean, in w what's wrong in general with, being, with living in this territory and in geographic terms, living eastward of Germany or eastward of, uh, of I don't know, Austria. There is nothing wrong with it. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's just the meanings that we immediately associate with it, Easterners. And then Easterners means post-communists, post-Soviets, I don't know, post-anything, post but not post-modern, definitely. Before, I will give uh, the floor to, to, to the public in, in a moment. Just let me just let me ask two more questions. Uh, one is about uh, different dimensions of this process of othering that was mm -hmm. underway after uh, it turned out that uh, the Visegrad countries turned down a uh, um, relocation program um, of the European Union. But let's not forget that, for example, the UK was also a country that turned it down flatly right mm -hmm. from the beginning. Um, but what were other dimensions of this othering? Because it seems to me that uh, this refusal uh, basically triggered uh, the process of basically reminding the Western European audiences in what respects are the Eastern Europeans different. So, for example, they took a different stand when it came to uh, intervention, military intervention in Iraq, uh, different than Germany or France. They uh, were much harsher when it comes to uh, even you know some some politicians and even popular opinion. Uh, for example, in Poland, uh, towards Greece uh, and the Greek debt crisis uh, was much more um, was much harsher than uh, the line taken by uh, even Angela Merkel. Um, and another dimension, for example, is Ukraine, of course, uh, in the Visegrad countries, but Poland in particular. Uh, considered uh, Ukraine and war in Eastern Ukraine much more important than, the, um, than most countries or most governments of Western Europe. So all of a sudden, um, turning down of the relocation program triggered uh, this whole uh, production of a, of a more or less coherent narrative of Eastern European otherness. I would like to ask you about other dimensions that just uh, supposed lack of solidarity of Eastern Europe towards towards the refugees. Other than refugees, yeah? yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to start a bit um, elsewhere because I would like to pick up on, on what has been said before in the discussion, but coming back to that, <laughs> because it relates actually to that. And this is the role of the media. And I would like to remind here the simple fact that there are actually real people behind the media. That's They're right. still there. These are people that are writing these articles, and yet they are interested in how many people read this article, but they are also people with views, opinions, and beliefs. And I think that, and what I would like to bring in in the discussion as a note, is a generation issue. Because one of the ways you could explain this otherness would be also to look at the generation that is, for instance, carrying out the media coverage and. Again, I can speak for the Czech Republic. And if you look at uh, the current media establishment in terms of who is in the editor position, who is in the position of the leader of the rubrique, you see that it's quite 
interesting that it's the same generation of people that were between 18 and 25 when 1989 came. Um, as, a, as part of my academic career, I'm a, a columnist in one of the Czech newspaper, and through that I had a lot of discussions in publishing my columns and why, and in these discussions I very often came across, I mean it's just a personal experience, but I very often came across a certain binary logics. The one binary logics that I'm going to quote here is a quite recent example about the TTP, TTIP, sorry, where I was trying to explain that uh, there is a possibility of criticizing the contract from, not from a radical left perspective, but that even moderate forces in Western Europe are doing that. And in that discussion, it came across that there is a stereotype, and this is the, the other way of the othering, that as if, there, as if there would be a causality that once you are against this contract, it means that you are against USA, and once you are against USA, you are for Russia. And for the first, at the first sight, you can, you can laugh, but then you look at the generation issue and you don't laugh anymore because it explains to some extent. These people were scholarized and they, they, they have studied and for a long time they've been thinking in these binary logics. I'm not, I'm not blaming them. This is how they came to that, to the journalism. And this is how they came toward their work. And I think it's, it's always a very fundamental intellectual challenge to subvert our own paradigms that, that we have been raised with. And the other generation issue I would like to bring here very briefly is the readers. Because I was, it's a very brief anecdote, I'm, I was giving a course on emotional content on policy events, where I'm trying to explain students that it's not only that emotions run high enough when something happens, but that events such as migration crisis are loaded with emotions because they're loaded with some experiences and some values. And we've been speaking to about 9-11, and every time I was speaking about 9-11, I was, I was asking them what they have been doing on that day, to explain them the, the emotional moment. And in 2015, I realized that I can no longer ask this question. Why? Because my students were five or six years old when it came. So then we changed the topic somehow and we started to talk about how they learned about 9-11. In what context did they learn about 9-11? And I was stunned by the responses and by the discussion it enrolled because it came to me very clearly that these kids were scholarized in a very strict binary logics of the axis of evil. It was, not like me, it was not like that in my generation. When I started to study political science, the world was complex. There were international relations, there were conflicts with Arabic countries, with Muslim countries, but it was complex. But by 2003, the latest, with the Iraq war, there was this axis of evil, and that's, that's the generation that actually was scholarized in the, that there is something as a Christian West and there is something as the Muslim East. So then again, if these are the readers, if these are the social media users, maybe we are going to, we should ask, maybe this, this explains something because, and I'm backed by the embeddedness of knowledge. So maybe they are othering in response of what they have learned and how they have been told the stories. And I mean, there is a huge work in political science about narratives and in cultural anthropology, how narratives are actually in our lives very important. So maybe we should look for these narratives. What, what narratives are behind this othering? Because maybe it helps us again to go to subvert this othering that we have. Right. Um, um, I very much agree on this generation and dimension. And um, what I would like to emphasize that to a great extent, it, this generational shift that countries in Central and Eastern Europe experience um, drives the debates, definitely. Um, we are basically, um, depending on how old you are, either you remember exactly what happened in 1989 and the events that led to the um, collapse of communism in Poland, or you don't remember it exactly, and then the world looks entirely differently to you, and you also filter the current developments differently through your cognitive mindset. So this is one issue we shouldn't forget about it. Um, in the debate on othering, what strikes me, if I look at the issues from the perspective of East Central Europe, and then if I switch and try to have this broader perspective. What I see, and I think this is a problem in this debate, is that there is too much of this regional eye 
we in Central Europe, we with the victims, we have been stereotypically accused of doing things wrong. We, 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 but this is the regional eye. There is too little of this European us. In 1989, when we became free, and the process of EU accession began from day one, essentially, we were arguing we want to return to Europe. If at that point some West European politicians uh, said, well, you are going to join Europe, you would hear Geremek responding instantly, we are returning to Europe, we are part of the European family. And no other examples give better um, depiction or confirmation of this than my own personal family example. My grandmother is from Cheshire. She was born uh, and raised bilingual, German and Polish. She, she loved C.C. and Franz Josef. Most probably she spoke, she spoke better German than Polish. Her name was written with Kuchera, with C.S. C.S.H., whereas half of the family would write it differently in a Polish way. Her friends were Hungarian and, uh, and Czech and Austrian, and no one really cared. This was Europe and everyone wanted to live, to live peacefully. And if there were some stereotypical assumptions about people living further to the east or further to the north, this was something that people, people would laugh about, and this is, you, this is why we have all this beautiful literature about this region. And I think by thinking too much of this regional eye, we as the post-communist countries, we sort of feel so uncomfortable in this course eh, that when it comes to problems like the migration and refugee crisis, because it is a problem, we sort of hide ourselves there inside and we are then unable to join a broader discussion and possibly lead it. Because our experiences with the Ukrainians, one million of Ukrainians arrived to Poland and they have integrated seamlessly. No one talks about it. Why isn't it possible that Western countries, those that build the stereotypes that we are unable to deal with today, why don't they take a lesson from us? Not in the way that we will tell them, but we could tell them at least, hey, you know, this is what happened here. It is related to our visa and immigration policy. We've been working on it for years. This is how it works here. Why don't you join us in discussing these issues? I think this is way more important than just reproducing these divides and talking about stereotypes and making ourselves feel bad about it, because then it feeds, of course, in this uh, powerful worldwide trend. Everyone wants to become a victim, everyone wants to be the messiah afterwards, and so on. So um, I, I, I just, I'll just stop here, because not to monopolize the discussion. Well, uh, I don't want to become a victim. Not you, no, this is why you are here as well. <laughs> no, it's uh, the, the, the question of this victimization that, yeah, we suffer, yeah, yeah, the, the narrative of suffering, and uh, which is very much present in Europe. It's uh, in, in this part of Europe that uh, the bul bulwark of Western civilization, which stretches from, from Bulgaria uh, up to Poland, and each nation saved Europe against. I don't know, Turks or Bolsheviks or, or both, and, and Austria has the same narrative, by the way. Uh, and ante, mura, ante murale. Uh, uh, but uh, answering or trying to answer your question, I think it's difficult to, 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 to you know, at the moment, first of all, at the moment we talk about the so-called Eastern Europe, and we use it because we, we are used to use it, uh, at the moment, we strengthen stereotypes. Yeah, mm. we reinforce mm. this this division, and it, this kind of a Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, and Northern Europe is not corrupted. Eastern Europe is corrupted. Southern Europe is even more corrupt. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> these are all you know cultural kind of images people have, which are usually based on nothing. Uh, the, 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 the Guardian has, or no, Oxford Dictionary has chosen the, the uh, word of the year, a new invention, post-fact, <laughs> yeah, is that facts doesn't matter at all. It's all created, and Trump is, uh, was an example of this, of this post-fact. And the use of this word has increased also, and I think there is something to this word, that, well, you know, nobody cares about facts. People just live as they used to, probably. They live in their images, and then they 
because it's a cognitive process that you need to map people to map territories and usually people on a given territory are all the same there. If they were all the same there, then you wouldn't have, you know, protests on the streets and the things like, uh, like this. But it's the question, and I can, I can say, well, okay, uh, in what way we are different from the so-called Western Europe? Well, we are more hospitable. We drink better than they do. Maybe not Irish. Uh, I, I can go on with all these stereotypes. And we are fighters. We never go with occupy, uh, occupy uh, and so on. It's a question of, or, uh, you know, salaries are lower, especially academic salaries are lower, uh, incomes per capita, and, then, and so on. And I think this is something which is not post-fact, but it's, uh, these are facts. And if you just think about Poland, these stereotypes about Poland, you, you, uh, which can be somehow used as an argument, and I am not saying that this is not the case. That, well, Poland is Catholic. Okay, it's culturally Catholic, but as church data show, 40% of people are regular churchgoers, church, uh, church goers, although 98% were Christ baptized. Is this Catholic or not? Is it more Catholic than Malta or Ireland? I don't know. But Ireland is in the West, so it, it's okay in Ireland. Abortion law over there, but it's not okay in Poland because it's conservative in this, in this fact. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that I am for this new abortion law, yeah, okay. uh, this attempt, uh, uh, and so on. Well, cultural fundamentalism. So religion, for instance, yeah, this is different. But the region is diversified. I mean, we say Eastern Europe, and you can say that in Eastern Europe people are so religious, more religious than in, in Ireland or in Spain or in Italy, Southern Italy. I, I, I don't know. I think in Czech Republic it's not the case, definitely. At least they are proud of it, yeah, that they are so, the, the, the highest number of atheists lives in Czech Republic, proportionally, of course. Uh, uh, or, uh, attitude towards uh, refugees. Well, actually, for I don't know, Serbia and Croatia were quite acceptable. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, acceptable. That Poland, because of the, you, uh, these are also political games. I mean, you you politicize some issues uh, which should be not, uh, go without saying, and then you use it for the current politics. And I hate it. But well, you could say that we. Ha Polish government and uh, Hungarian government expressly said, we won't accept it. Although, yeah, first they said that they accepted this quota, yeah, 7,000 plus. Mm. Uh, and then they, the other said, well, we will do everything we can not to accept it. Well, but what's the result of this quota system? Because maybe it's because of the obstruction of some, some leaders, but actually, I don't, re sorry, I don't remember how many, uh, I think 150,000 were meant to be relocated yeah, from Greece and, 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 and uh, southern countries up north. And how many actually were relocated after a year of this, uh, 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 this, this, uh, this was accepted? Three Five thousand. thousands. Three from Greece. Yeah. Mm. Five thousands altogether. So I would say other countries also boycotted it, as Britain. So I think it's a question that we should always, whenever we use such categories, we should think about this internal diversity, although one footnote, if Western societies, many Western societies are immigrant societies, many Central and Eastern European societies are not immigrant societies. There are minorities in some of them, but the case of Poland is a homogeneous society. Vrtovek used homogeneous in sense in ethnic and religious uh, pardon me? In what? It is, I said. Yeah, in Since 1945. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, I am talking about contemporary Poland. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and this is another one, another one, the tradition of Polish tolerance, which was not that tolerant, actually, but in comparison to Western Europe, it was. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, 
there is no connection between this historical Polish tolerance and the pride of us being tolerant. Because in a sense, when you look at what's going on in media, in, in the social media, and what people say and the academicians say, I, I wouldn't say Polish society is tolerant and it shouldn't be proud of this historical problem. There is no relation between these two issues. But whenever you ask uh, you know, people, you should write about this historical Polish tolerance because it is so important. And I said, well, it was there. Maybe it was there, but it's not. So, and there, there, there is, OK. Doesn't matter. Um, I, I use the, the, I, and I finish. Uh, I use the notion in relation to Poland, this footnote, yeah? Super, uh, Vrtovek used the notion of uh, super diversity for Western societies. And I use the term super homogeneity in the case uh, of Poland, yeah? With minorities uh, reaching up to two per, uh, three, four percent at best. So, to, 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 to wrap it up, I think we, whenever we use these categories, we should think about these diversities in the region, among the people, in the societies. And, and this is always simplification. And especially as, well, I, I hate this word because now everybody is an intellectual, but as intellectuals, let's say, you, we, should, uh, we should simply see that these this, this nuances and distinctions and you know it depends on the context and the whole you know the whole issue of east west also in political sphere it is a mutual relationship when you have us you have the other when you have other you have us and this is a constant you know creation and recreation of others and so on for some time these were the pigs yeah portugal italy greece and spain which were out in a sense Created as the other of contemporary Ireland. Europe. Ireland, Ireland was included. Ireland, Ireland. Was in it. you see? So did you see? They did it very quickly. <laughs> okay, I, as far as I know, the, the term pigs uh, meant all these Mediterranean uh, countries as bricks and, and you know. Yeah. Okay. No, but just uh, to quickly comment before I give the microphone to the, to the audience. Well, um, if we juxtapose diversity versus homogeneity in Eastern Europe. Well, after Brexit or, or uh, the electoral victory of Trump, can, you, can we really be sure that diversity is a guarantee of openness? I'm not so sure about it anymore. Um, let me give the microphone to the audience. If you have any questions, comments, you've been very patient with us, so now it's your turn. Yeah. Uh, just... Um comment on the fact that the panel came a bit too close to my taste to blaming this uh, othering uh, on the Westerners. Uh, and uh, I should probably uh, point out that uh, us as the Eastern European countries were pretty active in making the case for you know, being, uh, being singled out because uh, the uh, rational response to the migration crisis was uh, simply uh, not to comment and drag our feet so that we don't get too many of these refugees because I mean, the refugees are rational enough and they don't want to go into these countries for all kinds of reasons, uh, uh, economic but also uh, related to the homogeneity, I suppose. However, uh, the, uh, the Eastern European elites or the Visegrad elites uh, uh, took the opportunity to politicize the issue that was a non-issue for all of them, except yeah. for the Hungarians for whom it was transactional issues, how to let the refugees pass. Yeah, but in the Czech Republic we had regional elections uh, where there was 9,000 uh, extremist anti-refugee uh, uh, candidates, but we have 411 refugees. Uh, so you have 10 candidates for one refugee. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and that's a, that's a regional elections. Really? So uh, if, if uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunism simply of the elites was way too blatant. Yeah, they, this, is, this is where we cross the, the European values, that uh, uh, if you don't have to rock the boat, don't do it. But uh, uh, simply uh, Orban, Kaczynski team, Zeman, Fico, they could not resist it. And they uh, politicized essentially non-problem, because it's very, uh, very convenient for them, because they don't have to find the solutions, unlike the Germans or the Austrians who actually do have the refugees and do have to find uh, political solutions. So uh, on, on the elite uh, level, this blatant opportunism uh, creates quite a strong case for you know, this othering process, for picking up on the Easterners. 
but also has the non-early dimension uh, that, that the Western Europe, I mean, they have to put up with, what, four or five million of us living, you know, and most of us here live actually in Vienna uh, as uh, you know, citizens of the Eastern countries uh, living in the West. And uh, uh, so uh, it, there is an element of hypocrisy in, in kind of expecting that uh, we will be accepted, but we won't have to be accepting. Uh, so, uh, again, I would argue that on this uh, non-elite level, this is uh, uh, too blatant uh, a hypocrisy not to you know, single ourselves out uh, and uh, uh, not to be perceived as breaching some values that you know, we have to be reasonable for a uh, reasonable functioning of, uh, uh, of Europe. So, uh, I, I would be a bit more careful uh, about this active role of making ourselves different or allowing... Uh, politicization of non-issues, essentially, yeah. uh, for uh, very, very internal, uh, very internal reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as, as being obviously one of the few Westerners in this room, uh, it's, time, <laughs> it's time for complaint. Uh, I'm basically n- not a scientist, I'm a businessman, 25 years experience in uh, East Eastern Middle Europe, as I put it, because it's not Eastern Europe, just came back from Cluin, from Kiev. This is Eastern Europe for me. <laughs> um, first point, uh, and, and I, <clears throat> for, for me, walking on the streets of Prague, which I do twice a month, uh, the, I don't see any difference to Vienna anymore. So I was personally really shocked by this uh, refugee issue because I felt really let down by politician partly, but also by the existing or non-existing civil society, because uh, it, it made me the impression, well, um, there is a huge problem, so obviously one million here, 100,000 in Austria, and so on. Um, and the, the message from, from, let's call it the Visegrad state, was uh, we don't care. I mean, it's your problem. All the guys want to go to Austria and, and, and uh, Sweden and, and Germany. Um, you have to cope with it. And I or we, no, I had the impression that um, uh, in these 25 years it is seen, yes, as a, as a, uh, as a family, have sh- must showing solidarity. And I felt totally let down because uh, obviously there's a huge issue for some member states of the European family. And the Visegrad people, may, oh, sorry, maybe only the elite, maybe only the politician. I had the impression also the whole society said, I don't care. I don't care. Nowadays, political correctness is not so important, so um, not to watch it too much. So this, this is, I, was my feeling, and I think this was, was a widespread feeling that's in Austria and Germany, and I absolutely do not understand it. And then I, I discussed with my people, Czech Slovak Republic, to be honest, especially in the, in the Slovak Republic, and, um, and then something came up, and this is my second point, uh, this huge discussion about 10% of the population, and 10% of the population in the, in the, in the Slovak language are the Tsigani. And uh, when even my general manager talked about these people, I was totally, I was totally stunned. I mean, these were not, these are the others. So the argument that uh, uh, Eastern European society can't, cope with refugees, obviously, which Ukrainians in Poland are not seen as, as others, so no, they're not refugees. But we, they said we can't cope with them, we don't know them. We always a homogeneous society, we don't know them, so we, 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 we can't let them in because we can't cope with it. And then, I mean, at least in Czech and Slovak Republic, 10% of the population are the other. And, um, and they are, there's a deep-rooted hatred me against these people. So, um, yeah, there are some experience, some obviously very bad experience in, in coping with the others. And um, maybe this, this deep rooted feeling also is, is keeping the society at the point, don't let anybody in. We have this lengthy experience with uh, Roma and Sint, as we call them here. Uh, and these are not the people we would like to see to, to have more in our country. Uh, and yeah, mm. um, this is a, I'm always fighting against this, but. Um, in vain. 
in vain. Well, I found it interesting that several people mentioned political elites, implying that probably the rest of the people see things in a different way. And I've been thinking a lot if there is any difference between the reaction specifically to the refugees in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. And I think that if there is any uh, difference, it is exactly the fact that in Western Europe you have a debate about it. Some people think one thing, other people think another. Even Britain being a very good example, a country that has accepted hardly any Syrian refugees, which I think is very shameful. But there is a debate, and the debate is usually along the lines, what should we do? The only thing we should do to help is not necessarily to bring these people in. We can give money to camps in Jordan and so on. Now, I think that Eastern Europe really stands out here in the sense that societies that have been very much divided on other issues are sort of brought together in a way you can say that you can see the build-up of a civil society around the almost universal agreement in these countries that we don't want the refugees. Now, uh, I'm Bulgarian, I come from Bulgaria, and I imagine that Bulgaria is a very extreme example. But, you know, when I go back home, this is an issue that is almost impossible to discuss with people. I mainly know people from universities. My whole family is working at universities. I know friends from the University of Sofia. I find it impossible to talk about them on this issue. Uh, people very often tell me, oh, we're going to meet for coffee, but only if we're not going to talk about the refugees, because I might come up with a view that annoys them. So I think that there is a genuine a difference, and I think that the difference is not just in terms of the political elites or the intellectual elites or whoever, but it is amazing that there is such a huge agreement on this issue. Uh, and the second point I'd like to make is that I think that mainly today we've been talking about the Visegrad group, but I think that within Eastern and Central Europe there are differences as well. And one of the differences is that you have countries like Bulgaria and Romania that are basically failed states, that have the economic criteria not of poor European countries, but of real third world countries. And in this, in this sense, I think that probably the question that Bulgarians raise, uh, should we, being so poor, be expected to help other people, be taken actually quite seriously, you know, I know personally many pensioners in Bulgaria with a pension of 60 or 70 euros. And when they hear that refugees get 700 euros a month, of course they get very angry. Now, I'm not justifying that. I'm just saying that it's one of the reasons that Germany and Austria should help more than Bulgaria is obviously uh, has to do with economic reality. <laughs> Any more questions, comments? So let's give uh, our guests a chance to, to respond. Professor, shall I? Well, this was very interesting observations and comments, and, and I couldn't agree more. And um, wh what you said, this is exactly what I, what I was trying to convey. Um, what you said is the maybe better way of phrasing it. We shouldn't, uh, in particular with, reg with regard to um, the response of the Visegrad group to migration, um, maybe they have just run too fast. And what I'm hinting at is that um, several other countries in the European Union, they share the views of uh, the Visegrad group. And uh, my research on Greece or Italy suggests that well, they do understand the position and the stance of the Visegrad uh, countries towards the refugee crisis, and they basically welcome the fact that the borders were closed at some point, even if it caused a problem in transportation of goods because the migrants they started protesting, sitting on the rail tracks and so on. Because it was a clear signal sent to the traffickers in Turkey that no people would actually pass through Greece. So yes, we have, I don't know how many thousands of, about 60,000 of uh, 
at least 60,000 of um, <coughs> migrants and refugees, depending on their legal status, are now stranded in Greece. But very few new are coming because no, they know that there is no way up. So um, on many occasions, as you say, we sort of close ourselves too closely in our cocoon, thinking that we are so specific, so different in the region, whereas easy solutions based on communication are available there. Um, and the last point that I would make, most probably, um, is that well, there are several ways of... So the debate on how to deal, how to approach the migration crisis has only begun. The OECD has been particularly uh, active in this debate, highlighting the advantages of the refugee inflows, migrants, um, and they, the benefits for the host countries' economies. And um, it's always difficult to discuss these issues, but Deutsche Welle um, had a piece of news yesterday that suggested that 30,000 of refugees that have arrived to Germany last year are now able to maintain themselves without receiving any financial support from the state. Uh, so this should be encouraging. Now, the difficult question, of course, is uh, how we make it and what kind of refugees and how we prepare them to meet the expectations uh, of the labor market. So it's just, I think, the beginning of discussion. I'll just um, stop here. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, several issues. I mean, when you close one route, the other one is frequented much more. And then now mm -hmm. Italy is, again, you know, the most frequented route, which makes, uh, which causes that uh, thousand people or drawn in yeah. the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but, uh, yeah, mm, first the question of hypocrisy and so on. Yes, of course there is hypocrisy in this that, well, we don't want refugees, but we, uh, we take care uh, of, uh, of uh, our, our migrants in the UK, for instance. Yeah? When, when uh, people of color are beaten on Polish streets, the, the, the authorities do almost nothing. It's, it's, it's a tolerance for intolerance. And it's almost an official stand of the, of the authorities at the moment. Uh, and when there, is a, 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 it, there was this incident of, of a Pole which was killed in, what was the name, uh, nearby London, yeah, the three Polish ministers went there to, to, to learn what, what happened actually and so on. Yeah, this is this is uh, an instance of, of pure hypocrisy, but hypocrisy. Is hypocrisy. But the, the, the other point that uh, I think it, it's the question that they use the refugee crisis for current. I mentioned it for current political purposes, and yeah, that's right. That they do refer to some uh, social um, attitudes towards migrants. And you were right, yeah, that in, 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 in some respect these societies are somehow united by their attitude towards refugees. And I, I was also astonished by the approach of, of uh, some academicians to, towards uh, this issue. And then it's, uh, but yeah, this is the question of, 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 the, of the nasty, I would say, politics, which somehow thrives on the, uh, on the issue that, that that was also politicized and made a media issue. Yeah, it, this 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 fear was was totally un, not grounded in any reality. Yeah, people don't have uh, in the Polish case, people don't didn't don't have, have has never had any experience of of of, uh, of refugees or or even uh, immigrants. Well, uh, there was an. Uh, uh, research done, and uh, uh, only 28% of the Poles met any foreigner in the last year. Yeah. So, but 61% are afraid of refugees. Yeah, and then, uh, on, on, yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a uh, kind of a moral panic. Yeah, which in the Polish case, I would, uh, I would interpret it this way. I will interpret it this way. It's a, it's a, it's the other, it's the Oriental other, which is created, right? Turks, yeah, 
Poland fought with Ottomans, so we, we always should be aware of them. This is a distant culture. Of course, this, this argument is also raised, and it doesn't fit European values, all of the sudden uh, European values and Christian values. <laughs> and then the, 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 the question of, of, of them being, uh, you know, the, a religious threat, yeah, because there is a, and the Catholic Church in Poland, the stand towards it was really ambiguous and is very ambiguous because on the one hand you had Franciscus uh, and on the other hand you have some Polish archbishops even who say, well, yes, solidarity and, and, uh, and, and the things like this, but before you invite guests to your house, you should know what, uh, who these guests are. And we have invited in 14th, 13th century uh, Teutonic Knights, and then what happened, you know, uh, they, they actually uh, contributed to the, uh, to, the, to the collapse of the state and the things like this. Uh, second issue, racism. In Slovakia especially. I know Slovakia a little bit and I, was, I, has, I, have, always, I have always been astonished with the blatant racism towards Roma people there. It's, it's incredible. And, uh, well, maybe in the case of Slovakia, which is not the Polish case, but in the case of Slovakia, it contributes somehow to the anti-refugee you know, at, uh, uh, attitude of, of, of the population, that these refugees would be like, like these Roma people who, in their opinion, are only, you know, have to be supported by the state from their taxes, and they are lazy, of course. Uh, and, and, uh, and by the way, the opinion about refugees, uh, one of the reproduced opinions about the refugees is, is that they are lazy because, you know, or they are not fighters. They should stay in Syria and uh, fight for the free country, yeah? Especially young children, you know, 10 years old children. Yeah? Uh, okay. Uh, and this political hypocrisy and attitudes towards the others and especially refugees, it is, it fits somehow towards the, this rightist politicians, I won't name them again, you know, overall picture that we should resist Europe. Europe is a, is a new Kremlin. A Brussels is a new Kremlin. It fits the picture that we should build a strong nations, and strong nation doesn't accept any any you know uh, dirt on it. And refugees would be uh, would be these distant others and so on. And we shouldn't import problems. We have enough our, our we shouldn't share this. We are poor, so why should we uh, share our poverty with them? Uh, and and the, and the things and. In this nationalist policy altogether, yeah, uh, which is used in the internal fi fights for, for power. And, well, it came like a gift from heaven, in a sense, to this rightist political party in Poland. Before presidential elections and before uh, parliamentary elections, this <coughs> refugee crisis, because they use it and they, they used all these, you know, nasty descriptions that you can find on, on, on a neo Nazi fora almost, yeah, uh, 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 expressed by the top politicians. Yeah, I think I have, in one way or the other, addressed all three questions, so thank you. Okay, I'm going to make a, some last comments to, to these questions, and uh, since I've been speaking about uh, narratives that are driving our society, I'm going to offer you a narrative. And I liked your point about the Prague and Vienna, that when you are in the streets of Prague, you don't realize any difference. And uh, I would argue my, I would argue on my, uh, in my way that I do realize a difference when I go through the streets in Prague. I don't see enough pathways for people that are immobile. I don't see enough elevators in the public transport so that people, so that mothers with their buggies could uh, use them. And especially I see a lot of co-working spaces where mothers are working and the children are just playing next to them, which is actually one of the everyday occurrences related to the fact that Czech Republic still doesn't have a shortened maternity leave as you have, for instance, in Vienna. So with this anecdote, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to say is that once you look at the Czech Republic and how it governs the everyday life, 
one narrative would be that what has uh, become a very powerful way of governing is that you govern the mainstream. So um, to put it in a stereotype way, when you're white, male, European, over 35, you're fine. When you're a child, when you're a woman, when you're Roma people, you have a difficult life because governing diversity has been very, very difficult in, in these times that we are speaking about. It has been difficult for a number of reasons that I cannot articulate here, but the, one of the reasons was first that it was, it was always argued that there is a lack of financial resources that we should first fit the economy and then this comes. But it tells you also a lot about what we've been discussing here, that governing diversity is actually a very difficult task to do, which means involving everybody. And we have seen that even Western Europe has its limit in involving everybody. And I think when you, when you stick into this governing diversity versus governing mainstream, then probably you should ask, as, as you said, that yes, the political elites were very, very successful in politicizing the issue. And then the question would be why they have been so successful. Why these people have actually, there was something that resonated in the everyday life of Czechs, that they said, yes, this is it. Why didn't I have been thinking before that? Because you have somehow unlocked the paradox that there are no refugees, but the refugee is a constant issue in the media and in regional politics. So it resonates with something, something, something and now I'm repeating myself, we are embedding the knowledge in some, something different. And you, you name the Roma people, which is one of the explanations, but I think a different, but I would go even farther and say that there is really, there has been something that I faced as a, a sort of a emigrant from the country, that there is a much more difficulty in how you govern diverse views, political views, social views, social roles, that people are not really so comfortable with. You would have a historical explanation. Roger Brubeckel would tell you that the region was actually uh, pretty much overwhelmed by, by the collective argument and that it was actually, that stigmatized the individual argument. I don't know if this is the explanation. And the other explanation in the Czech context would be as one of the very large and very good studies at the Charles University suggests that if you look at how the policy discourse has developed in the 1990s onward, uh, and if you look how it was the used, uh, how it used the word social, you would realize that actually it was used as a bad word and all sorts of social actors have been stigmatized. And in quite ironic way, you could ask where are the Czech social democrats in the country? Because somehow if you look at what policy steps have been done, some of them, then you would just again see a sort of so maybe we can see that in this kind of a diversity paradigm. And I think it much resonates to what the lady from Bulgaria said about this, how you cannot even discuss the issue. And I think we're coming back, I'm sort of coming back of what I said before, that regardless the values you have, and regardless the ethical pole on which you stand, the civil society means a possibility to discuss. It means a constant moment of critique. And I think this is one of the crucial issues that should be supported, whether we say we are for something or against something. Unless we keep discussing, we're still fine, because when we don't discuss anymore, that's the danger that we are running into. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, comments, your patience. I thank sincerely my guests. Uh, just two brief uh, uh, pieces of information. First of all, you might have noticed there is a book in a smaller room, smaller part of the library. Uh, if you're interested in intellectual history of Eastern Europe in general, Poland in particular, uh, you are welcome to, uh, to take a copy. It's a product of a collaboration of the Institute and a group of researchers from the University of Warsaw. And secondly, we invite you downstairs. There is some wine and cheese waiting for us so we can continue the discussion more informally. Thank you. This is why your patience <laughs> will pay off. <laughs>